Genesis 28, verse number 1. The Bible says, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. This really is a continuation of what we've already looked at last week, where, again, Jacob um, uh, took the blessing uh, this, uh, in, uh, he, as tricking his father, uh, as posing as Esau, his brother, and uh, remember, Rebekah had talked to Isaac about uh, him uh, uh, leaving, Jacob leaving, and she gives the reason that uh, she doesn't want Jacob to take a wife from, the, from, the, from the, uh, those that are in the land. And, that, and of course, that is according to what shouldn't have happened. Uh, but we know that the other motive behind that is Esau is, wanting to, is looking to kill Jacob. He's, he wants revenge, and she's concerned about his life. But we also see uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the time where Jacob begins to reap what he has sown. And before we get into the message itself, let me just say this. What you do in your life, while you may think you're getting away with something, you're doing wrong, uh, either in this life or in the next life, you're going to reap what you sow. Uh, and that goes for a Christian as well. If you've sown bad things in your life, you're going to pay for those things. Jacob here, you say, well, Jacob, I mean, he, he ran away from Esau. Esau didn't kill him. Yes, but he has to leave his home. Uh, Rebekah will not see her son. Uh, he's lost, though, he's going to lose what she, what she thought was only a few days. And notice here, uh, let me see, I want to make sure I get this, I get this correct here. Um, Yes, look at verse 43. I know we're bouncing back to chapter 27, but this is laying some groundwork. Chapter 27, verse number 43, she says, Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee thou to Laban, my brother, to Haran, and tarry with him a few days until thy brother's fury turn away. You know what she thought? Well, it's just going to be a few days. Maybe a few months, maybe a year at the most. What, turned in, what was a few days turned into 20 years? This is where, and this is a different side of it, but this is where sin takes you further than you thought you would go. In this case, he loses years of where he could have seen his mom, he could have seen his father, he could have had years with his brother. What you do will affect those around you. Now, I know this is the practical side of this lesson, and we'll see other things that... There's a lot of historic and a lot of doctrine. A lot of we see the the blessing turning over to Jacob, and we see the history of Israel. But let's not miss the things that really we ought to get out of this. And that is Jacob, in a practical, just a practical application. Jacob loses years he could have had with his family. He could have spent. Yeah, he could have went to Haran and come back. He, you say, well, he, was, he would have needed to get a wife from Haran. Yes, he could have done that. Or he, it could have been done like was done for his father. And he would have never left the land. He said, well, he had to go some way. It could have been different. And you, you, could, you could miss out on a lot of blessings because of the actions you take in your life if you're out of the will of God. And don't miss that. Do not miss that. Now, God's going to work behind the scenes. And here's the beautiful thing about our Lord. There, I, I sometimes struggle even using this term because I feel like people want a way out. But there is a, there's the perfect will of God and there's the permissible will of God. That is, there's, the, there's where God's going to still work in your life, but you may, you may miss some blessings and some things that would have been the perfect will for you but God can still get glory out of your life and God can still use you. In our case, God can still use us when we make a mess of things and still get glory, but it could have been different. It could have been different. And in this case, 
God's going to work behind the scenes and in the result, Jacob still, things are still going to work out to where they need to be. But it could have been different. And Jacob is going to take some time and he's going to make, take some major steps into spiritual maturity. You, your life, you take, you're going to take time. All of us take time to spiritually mature in our lives. We see the physical maturity, don't we? But there's a spiritual side to our lives that we don't always see, but it takes time to grow into what God wants us to be. I, I, say, I, tell, our, I tell my boys, I said, you, you, you're, growing up into, you're going to grow up into a man but don't think that when you turn 18 one day, you're a man. There's responsibility. There's so many things in your life that has to mature. And there's also what's spiritual maturity in your life. And I know, I know I'm talking to the choir, many of this in this room, but I know I have younger ones too. It takes time. And there's not, you can't put an age on it. There's not a physical age on it. Now, I've got to continue to move. I know I'm... I'm talking about that, but I'm laying some groundwork in hopes that you see these things as we go along this morning. So Isaac charges Jacob here. He tells him, he calls him, he blesses him, he charges him. Now, you know, since there was a blessing, there's going to be a charge, right? He's blessed him, now he's going to charge him with some things, some, some things to think about, some things to consider. A charge was needed because there was a blessing going on. And the content of this charge was that he was not to take a wife from the Canaanites. And remember, the Canaanites were a people full of whoredoms, idolatry, abominations, according to what we know from Scripture. He wasn't supposed to take a daughter from there. We already know Esau had done some of that, and he was telling his son not to do that. He needed to avoid those, those, those women. Reminds us that there are some people, and again, I know we've got to be a witness, but that doesn't mean we need to partake of their, their actions and their things We've got to be a separated people. And we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But it's necessary if we're going to be a light to this world that we can't just take parse and parcel of everything that the world does. Because then you're not a witness. You're not a light. So he wasn't take a wife from this, this people of the land. He was take a wife from the, do, uh, from the daughters of Laban. Now Isaac blesses Jacob here. And we see that in, in, the, in the verse here, verses 3 and 4. He tells him that God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee that thou mayest be a multitude of people and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger which God gave unto Abraham. Reminds us of the fact that Hebrews 11.20 says, By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Uh, that's Hebrews 11. And that's in reference back to what occurs here. You know, the other thing that we ought to remember is that commands sometimes seem contrary to the promise. You understand that, well, he's supposed to inherit the land, so then why is he going away? I thought he was supposed to inherit the land. Well, you know, sometimes we're told to do something that may be like, well, how is that accomplishing what I'm supposed to do? Lord, why do I need to go to Bible college to prepare to be a preacher? Well, you need to learn the Word of God. Now, not everything in Bible college can really prepare you to be a pastor. And I know this man knows that. I know that. There, there are some things you cannot exchange for on-the-job training. And sometimes you've got young men going to Bible college thinking, well, when I get out, I'm ready to do anything. No, you're not. But there is a truth in preparing for what you're going to do. Don't expect that you're going to run a company without coming up through the ranks. Don't expect that you're going to know how to, uh, to be a scientist without... And I know my, my group in here are older than this, but the young ones downstairs, you know, they want to do this and they want to do that. Well, you've got to study your math. I hate math. Well, don't think you're going to be a nuclear scientist without studying math, buddy. You know, I'm, just, I'm being a little extreme with that, but there's preparation. And sometimes you might feel like, well, how is that accomplishing anything? Well, don't think you're going to run a division of a company without first, and I know sometimes this doesn't always happen today, but a really good boss has come up through the ranks. You need to get down on the floor and know how things run. Visit, understand, work it sometime. Then you understand the people underneath you and what they're going through. See, honestly, the way up is down. 
And so sometimes commands seem contrary to the promise, but obey the command and you will see the blessings. Joshua 24, 14. And in Joshua, and you can turn here, the people were to inherit the land, but there were some things they were supposed to do. Joshua 24, 14, it says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. The people were commanded, look, if you're going to keep the land and you're going to dwell in the land, God has some commands. If you don't obey the commands, then the land's going to spew you out like it, it spewed out the inhabitants before you. And see... See, here's the thing. Liberty and freedom doesn't mean you can do everything you want to do. And that's the problem with our society today in this country. Even in liberty, when our forefathers penned the Constitution and penned the Declaration of Independence and penned laws, the idea is that if your liberty tramples on my liberty, then it's not liberty at all. There are some commands to follow. You live in your, under your mom and dad's roof, there was commands to follow. And when you follow those, if you're obedient then everybody has real liberty. And so, it's not freedom to do whatever I want to do. And so the Lord, even the Lord said, look, I'm going to give you this land, I'm going to let you inherit it, and there's freedom, and the law that I give you is also the law for the stranger in the land. Have you ever read that recently? Does that sound like the laws of our land in a lot of ways? Do you understand that the laws that God gave the Jews, He even states as much, that the laws when it came to though the neighborly laws, the, the, neighbor, the laws between man and man, he says there's a law for you and for the stranger. Those laws were to be obe obeyed. And so the Lord says here, look, I, look, if you want to keep the land, Joshua now here, he says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in truth and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And you know what he was telling them? And you see this in Deuteronomy where Moses repeats it to the, the, the generation that would inherit it, and Joshua repeats it before, in the land and, and before he dies. Look, if you will serve the Lord and Him alone, then all this land will be yours. But if you don't, then the land will spew you out just like it spewed out the inhabitants before you. You say, well, what's this got to do with Jacob? It has a lot. He was, he, Isaac is telling him, look, you need to do these things, obey my voice, and it'll go well. And you know what, today, we have, a, we, have a, we have the Word of God. God gives us some things that we need to do. And for some reason, we're so stubborn and so, uh, so ignorant uh, of if it's never worked before, why do we think we can live however we want and God's just going to bless us? And I said last week, I think it was last week, we put God's name on everything. And then we think, well, if we put God's name on it, it'll be fine. No, it won't. God's not anywhere near you. He's not going to, he's not going to share His glory with your mammon. And, and, and again, we, we, we just think, that we can call our, we can put Christian on it and think it's fine, but in reality it's not. And so, um, and then we wonder, we start, turn around and wonder why we have trouble in our lives. Now, I understand. Again, there's trials and things that come. You're serving the Lord still, but sometimes those trials are because, and those troubles are because God's trying to get your attention about something. And so Esau here, we see a contrast though. Jacob is obeying the voice of his father. And again, I know we've got, we, we know what he did, but in Esau's case, Esau observes some things here. Notice here, I think I left off at verse number 5, so we'll pick up at verse number 6 here, chapter 28 of Genesis. It says, When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take him a wife from thence, and that, he, as he, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padan Aram. And Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father, then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had, which he had Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Nebajoth, to be his wife. You know what Esau's doing? And there's two sides to this, and I want to give you both. He sees the blessing of Jacob. He sees what's going on. He says, okay, 
And you can look at this two different ways. And I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to lean one way or the other. One way is you can see that he's coming halfway in these, and he's coming halfway in order to please. And I think that may be the case. Remember, he'd already taken wives of the people of the land. He'd messed up. He's trying to make up for it. I also think, too, that even at this point, maybe Esau has seen some of his bad behavior and the things he's done, and he's trying to maybe make amends. You ever see somebody that maybe they're doing it in their own flesh, and maybe that's what you have with Esau? But they're trying to they're trying to make some things right, but it's it's not really. There's some things in your life you can never undo, right? And Esau sees here, he's 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 trying to he's trying to make some amends. He's trying to he sees okay what I did back here isn't pleasing obviously because mom and dad has said you need to go to Haran to get a wife. I've taken women of the land. Let me go to Ishmael, their family, right? And you can look at this in a couple of ways. You can see this as the Christian that they're trying to please God in their in their own in their own in their flesh, but it's really not what God really wants. You can also see that maybe you can can you also see the heart of Esau? Maybe in his his best he can, he's trying to do right. He's trying to make amends. He's trying to, he, he's trying to make up for his, uh, his ways. But again, is it enough? Is it enough? And we'll talk more about Esau down the road. But, uh, but you, you just see Esau there trying to do something. Trying to make some things right. And yet, uh, it, it's, it's, it's what's really bad. He's adding tolerable to what's bad in this case. It's okay, well that's, it's better than it was, but there's some things in your life you can't ever really change. You just got to go and get forgiveness and move on and move on past those things. And sometimes there's scars that are never, never going to go away in life. Genesis 28, verse number 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night. Because the sun was set, and he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and the God of Isaac. The land wherein thou liest to thee will I give it to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Jacob, he leaves. Uh, It's estimated that this trip, remember he had been in Beersheba, and uh, he's going to Haran. Haran was about 500 miles away and would take about, it'd take several weeks to, to complete. Remember, we're not jumping in our car and driving up to Haran. We're, we're getting on a donkey, we're getting on a camel, maybe walking by foot. This is going to take some time to complete, folks. There's a journey in front of him. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, in all of our lives, we have a journey. And my journey is not your journey. My race is not your way. race. Our youth this, this year, uh, we chose a theme. I chose a theme last year. We, we're we're doing, uh, running, the, running a race, running to win. And you know what? There's, poor, there's everything about running. There's different aspects of running. And every aspect has an effect on your run. And in this case, Jacob's going to have to have a point in his life where he comes to grips with Jacob. He's going to, and it's not happened yet. This is the start of that. God's going to visit with him. But there's going to be things he's going to have to learn. And, and, and again, I, I hope you understand, when we do these, less, when these lessons, 
the book of Genesis is wonderful. Because I know the opportunity to teach it in the Institute, you see some things, you see these different people and what God does in their lives. In our lives, we all have a race. Everyone has a point in life where they're either going to, and there's more than one time, where you're going to face a brick wall. You're going to face something in your life where you need God to intervene. And you're either going to trust God or you're going to trust your own instincts. And if you, if you choose the wrong way, you're going to make a mess and you're going to make a mistake in your life. You need to trust God. And in this case, you see here, God initially visits with him but he's going to have more than one occasion where Jacob at times is going to trust Jacob and there's other times he's going to have to listen to God. And in this case, we see here that Jacob, it comes to rest here in Bethel. And in verse 11, we see that he lights upon this place. He tears there all the night. He takes, the, he takes a st- some stones out of that place and he makes them for his pillows and he lays down and he goes to sleep. And Bethel here, he's about 70 miles north of where he started. And it would have probably taken him at least three days to get this far. And Jacob here dreams a dream. Now, dreams and visions are different. A dream is a vision when one is asleep. And most in this room, you know that already, but it at least needs to be stated uh, for those watching and those maybe here that dr- these, this vision of one sleeping is that dream. A vision is a revelation to one that is awake. Now, let's look at a couple of these things. Turn back to Genesis chapter 20. And we see here this, what a dream would be in Scripture. Genesis 20, verse number 3, it says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night, and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. So Abimelech, God comes to him in a dream. And we see here that in Jacob's case, God com- comes to him in a dream. A vision, on the other hand, and and I'll just read this, is one that's when you're awake. Ezekiel had this at the start of the book of Ezekiel. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Chebar, that the heavens were open, and I saw visions of God. He was awake. He was by the river there, and he looks, and there's this vision, this heavenly vision of, uh, of God. So that's when someone is awake, there's that revelation. So in Jacob's case, he's asleep, he has this dream, and this dream is that a ladder ladder is set up on the earth, and the ladder reached up into heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on this ladder. Can you imagine this dream? It's amazing. It's an amazing dream. And the latter here in verses 11 and 12, he says in verse 12 of, of our context, Genesis 28, it says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And verse number 13, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, the land whereon thou liest to, uh, liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And so just as, he, just as God has promised his father... And his father's father, he's now going to tell Jacob the same thing. And you see this through Scripture. The Lord always makes Himself known to that next patriarch and lets him know, and He reiterates what He's already promised. Do you know what we have? We have the Word of God that, we, that is passed down. It, God's preserved it. But we have to reiterate what we've been taught. Do you remember Paul? Paul said to teach others also. And they have to build upon that which is they've been taught. I know it's different. I know it's a totally different thing. You have the children of Israel. But in reality, we have some things that we have to reiterate. And you know what's, what's beautiful? God comes and visits the next generation. And God makes Himself known to the next generation. Uh, and, that, and we have to reiterate what God's given us. And our next generation has to build upon that which we've given them. But then God comes in His Spirit and He helps them. And your, your goal is that they get stronger. Stronger and stronger for the Lord. That's what we want. That's our goal. And in this case, the Lord is going to make Himself known as He's always done. He's always faithful. I mean, if there's any problem, it's not God. 
<laughs> it's, it's the people. It's the individual. It's us. And so he makes himself known to Jacob. Now this latter, again, is, uh, and many of, this, many of you all already know this, but it's a type of Jesus Christ. Turn over to John 1. Uh, he says here, Jesus says, And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Do you know that this latter, in Genesis chapter 28, is a type of Jesus Christ? Think about it with me. The latter extends all the way to heaven, but it's resting on earth. Do you know what Jesus Christ was and is? He is our connection between us and heaven. He came down from heaven. He is our way to heaven. Remember Adam, what Adam lost in the garden, God, uh, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, got back. We had a bridge. We had a, a gulf, a, a gap between us and God. Because when Adam sinned, he broke that relationship with him and God. And when he broke that relationship, man was cut off from God. We needed somebody. And no man, just regular man, sinful man could not bridge that gap. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming in the form of, of, of flesh, took sin upon Himself for us. And He made a way again for us. He is that ladder between us and heaven. He is that one that's bridged the gap between us and God. No man could do that. No regular man could do that. But God Himself in flesh could. And He bridged that gap. And so we see there's that connection between us and heaven. Romans chapter 8, verse number 3 says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sent in His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh. All law could do is say you're guilty. Law showed man for what he was. You're a sinful, unrighteous, unholy individual. Law, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus Christ. And we see here the Lord took on the likeness of sinful flesh and became man. It became sin for us. In reaching to heaven, we see that Jacob's ladder reached all the way to heaven, and the Lord was not only man, but at the same time, He was entirely God. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It was God Himself that came in the form of sinful flesh. It wasn't sinful but in the form of such. We see this ascending and descending here in the passage in, in Genesis chapter 28. And just so, we see that it is only by the ascending and descending of, our, of Jesus Christ and His finished work that we will one day ascend to be with the Father. John chapter 1, verse number 51 says, And He saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Uh, verse, uh, chapter number 3, verse number 13 of John says, And no man has ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. We see also there was the knowledge of God because Jacob knew not the Lord's presence until the, uh, the latter descended from heaven. Because remember, what does he say here? Well, notice, uh, look, look at verse number... 16 of chapter 28, page over for me, it says, And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. Jacob had no idea. When we know God's everywhere, but there's that special presence, right? There's that special presence of God. And he says, He knew it not until the Lord revealed Himself. And we notice here that we would lack knowledge of the Father without the Christ without Jesus Christ coming. Remember, and I'm going to give you a couple of verses here. John chapter, uh, John chapter 1, verse number 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 18 of that same chapter says, No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. If it wasn't for the Son of God coming, man would still be in darkness. 
Do you remember that when, do you remember there was that 400 years of silence? There was that silence when, when the Old Testament was finished. There was that gulf, that time of silence and darkness. And then what does the New Testament start with? You have a maid in Israel that gets word from the angel Gabriel. You, get, you see that the, that the angel goes to a, a man by the name of Joseph. You see that Elizabeth and Zechariah, Zechariah gets the angel beside the incense altar there in the temple. That's when, that's when things start to happen again. He doesn't go to the king in the palace. He doesn't go to someone grand. He goes to a priest. He goes to, he goes to a maid in Israel that's just being faithful. That's where he goes. That's where the moment of silence stops, uh, breaks. And he goes to some lowly folks that are just being faithful. Oh, God wants our faithfulness. Right? And he goes, and that moment of silence breaks, and then you have the start of the New Testament. You have Jesus Christ. You have, uh, you have, uh, you, you have John the Baptist come up on the scene to prepare the way of the Lord. And you have Jesus Christ up on the scene and you have your New Testament. But if He hadn't come, folks, we'd still be in darkness. Especially everyone in this room with a, with a, with a few exceptions. John 14, 9 says, Jesus then to, saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, Show us the Father? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Blessed are they that have not seen, and yet believed. He tells Thomas, We haven't seen Jesus Christ. We haven't seen God the Father. But you know what? I know Him anyway because He dwells in me. 1 John 1, 2, For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. It's made known. All right, back to our passage. Look at Genesis chapter 28. Notice here we've already read verse 16 there. And again, we have to continue to move. Let me just say this. We see a a sevenfold promise from the Lord starting in verses 13 all the way down to verse number 15, the Lord makes a promise to Jacob here. He makes a promise of the land in, chap- in verse 13. He makes a promise of the seed in chapter uh, in verse number 14, of a blessing in 14. And then He makes a promise. He, he deals with the land. He deals with the, with the, with the seed, you know, what's going to come after. He deals with that blessing. But then, but then, He does something else. If that was just all then there would be a question. But you know what God does? He makes it personal to Jacob then. You know what God does for us? He makes some promises, but then He has some promises that are personal to us too, doesn't He? Salvation is personal, is it not? Look what He does. He says, He gives a promise of His presence. He says, I will be with thee and will keep thee. Verse 15. Verse 15, He makes a, he makes a promise of His presence to him. He makes a promise of protection for him. He makes a promise to guide him. He says, I will bring thee again to this land. And then he makes a promise of preservation. For I will not leave thee. What does he make a promise to the disciples there standing in the Gospels? And he makes a promise to us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Verse number 16. Verse number 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again into my Father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be be God's house, and of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. So we see that when Jacob wakes up, he is he's amazed. In fact, he, he says, how dreadful is this place? Notice some things here. There's a fourfold conclusion that Jacob makes. And I'm just going to briefly give it to you. Number one, we see that he, he figures out the Lord has been in this place. He says, surely the Lord is in this place in verse number 16. Though Jacob knew it not, he finds out, hey, God was here. You know, many times we fail to recognize God's presence as He works in our lives. 
And it's only through those circumstances. And sometimes we go through circumstances and we say, Lord, where are you at? He's here. He was always there. We just didn't see it. We didn't recognize it until much later. Until we say, oh, God worked that out. But I didn't see how He could work that out. But He worked it out. He says, how dreadful is this place? You know, fear can cause man to serve God with greater conviction and obedience. When he gets a revelation of God, he okay, God is powerful. God is knowing. God, God, God could come at any time. And you know what? And, and maybe this is a spin from, from what I'm seeing here. And, and, and you know, I, I don't want to be applying something that, that's not there. But, you know, really, we ought to be fearful because there, God could come at any time. For us, the rapture of the church, the blessed hope, God, Jesus Christ could come at any time. That ought to give us some fear. Say, Lord, am I being obedient to you? Am I, am, am I, am I following you? Am I trusting you? Am I, am I living my life that's that's pleasing to you? Because one day I will give an account, not to whether I'll get to heaven or not. It's am I going to lose some rewards or not? Am I not going to get some rewards that I could have if I've been busy for you and not consumed with myself? Fear can cause man to serve God. And I've got some verses on that, but just for sake of time, we can't turn right now. We see this, and we also see that he says this is none other but the house of God. And we see here that it was the house of God because it was determined that he was dwelling there. At the same time, we understand God's not limited to a place or some time frame. We dealt with this just last week in the Institute. God dwells outside of time, in eternity. He's not bound by time. He's everywhere, but there's always those special times that he makes himself known in circumstances. And we also see that he says this is the gate of heaven. Now, notice something. Because of this fear, because of this, this word from God, you know what it does? It spurs Jacob to move ahead. Notice what it says that in verses 18 and 19, it says, Jacob rose up early in the morning. Do you know what sometimes we see? That is when we get charged by the word of God, we let the Lord get in our heart and work again in our heart anew. It will spur us on. When's the last time you let God spur you on? He got up early. He went. He moved ahead. Are we moving ahead? Are we taking two steps back? And we see the actions of Jacob here. He sets up a pillar for the stone from the stones he had used there for his pillow that night before, and he anointed that pillar with oil. And notice something. He renamed the place from Luz to Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. You know, there's those times in your life that you need to note where God came through and you need to remember those times and go back to those times and remember, hey, God was there and He was there and He was there and He was there. Ah, oh, I think He'll be with me again, won't He? <laughs> Don't forget those times because it's those times that in those hard times, Jacob had just come off a of defeat. Yes, it was his fault, but it was still a defeat. He's having to leave home. Those are those times in your life where maybe it's a defeat that you caused or maybe it's a defeat that you were trying to do right and yet it was still a defeat. In your mind, in your heart, it was a defeat. But then God meets with you. Don't forget those times where God meets with you. And mark those times and remember those times. So what does Jacob do? He makes a vow to the Lord. And he makes a vow that he would give a tenth of his goods to God. And we see this is the second time mentioned of tithing in the Bible, we saw the first time in Genesis 4, 14, verse 20, where uh, Abraham gives a tenth of all that he has to Melchizedek there in Genesis chapter 14 after the, after the battle with, uh, with the kings of the east. And so God works within our lives in hopes of bringing results in our lives, from our lives. God gets in our lives, and sometimes, yes, He does allow trials. He does allow circumstances. He does allow things... But He only does those things so that He might perfect us into what He wants us to be. May we use those life-changing times to spur us on, just as these times spurred Jacob on to move forward. And let's not move backward. And so what are you presently doing, going through? Maybe you're enduring that maybe you need to stop and note that God's in the middle of it and let God have His perfect work. 